Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. Well, welcome to Theology in Perspective. I'm Daniel Woodhead, and I'm blessed you could join us again today. We're in the Christmas season, and I want to do three shows about Christmas from the Bible. You know, as part of the birth of Jesus, we read in the account in the Gospel of Matthew of Herod the king of Judea receiving some people from an eastern land that were alerted that the true king of the Jews had been born. Now, as a result of their visit, Herod and uh, the general population of Israel were threatened, of Jerusalem, actually, were threatened. Now, just who were these people, and why was Herod threatened? God was bringing his long-awaited Messiah to this earth, and the ungodly were going to try, but would not be able to stop his plan. Now, let's read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when Herod heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written through the prophet. And from Micah 5.12 we read, And thou, Bethlehem, land of Judah, art in no wise least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come forth a governor, who shall be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod uh, privily called the wise men and learned of them exactly what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search out exactly concerning the young child, and when he had found him, bring me word that I may come and worship him. And they, having heard the king, went their way, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. You know, the vast majority of the Jewish people should have been looking for their Messiah because he was prophesied in the Old Testament in several hundred places. That they were just unaware of the birth of Christ. Whereas these Gentiles from the eastern region in Mesopotamia came and knew who the Messiah was. They acknowledged him as king. You know, the same situation exists today. We anxiously await the arrival of the second coming of the Lord Jesus, and most people could care less. But those of us that know him look for him to appear at any time, as the scriptures have promised. Not only was Jesus a, a physical earthly king, by virtue of his lineage from David, but by virtue of the fact that those in the world who were official kingmakers recognized him as such. Now the Magi were from Media, Persia, and they were Persian kingmakers. After the Babylonian Empire fell in 539 BC, the Medio Persian Empire took control of the region of Mesopotamia, east of Israel. And following that empire, Alexander's armies conquered it for the Greeks in five or excuse me, 328 B.C., when he died just five years later, one of his generals, Seleucus Nicator, took control of the area, and he finally lost control of it to the Parthians in 139 B.C. 
Now, magi is an old Persian word from Magav, and it refers to a, a certain very wise, hereditary, priestly tribe of people that came from the Medes. Uh, the term is also translated Megistanes, Megistanes, and it's from we get the, the from we get the term magistrates. These magi were so powerful that historians like Herodotus tell us that no Persian was ever able to become king except under two conditions. One, he had to master the scientific and religious discipline of the magi, and he had to be approved of and crowned by them. So in effect, they controlled who was going to be king in Mesopotamia. And having, through the years, risen to a place of, of really great prominence in the kingdoms of Babylon, Media, and Persia, they served as advisors to the ruler. So this term uh, became synonymous in, in, in many ways uh, with being wise men. This is how our English translated uh, the word magav as wise men. Now, Sometime after the birth of Jesus, some God-fearing magi arrived in Jerusalem asking for the king of the Jews. And it wasn't just three. It was many, 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 as we will see as we uh, tell the story here. I want to look for a moment, though, at this man, Herod the Great. He was half Jew and half Edomian, mean uh, that he was a partial descendant from the Edomites, which is a group in southern Jordan today, um, and uh, he gained favor with the Romans who had controlled Israel at that time, and uh, he was the son of a man called Antipater, the procurator of governor of Jerusalem and Judea. Now, Herod had played so much up to the Romans, occurred so much favor with them, that they appointed him as a uh, uh, title they gave Tetrarch of Galilee up in the northern region of Israel about 47 BC. It was a lesser position in terms of uh, significance, but nevertheless it was a position of honor amongst the Romans. Seven years later in 40 BC when the eastern Parthian Empire attacked the Romans at Israel, civil war broke out and Herod quickly fled to Rome. He chose wisely who he thought was going to be the prevailing party. He convinced the Senate that he was very pro-Roman, and from that part of the world, he knew how to handle regional political situations. So the Romans made him the king of the Jews. They even gave him an army, and they charged him with the job of bringing Israel under control. The Romans wanted the peace. They wanted the Pax Romana, which is what they sought after. And um, they did get it under Herod. After three years, Herod, being successful, was finally able to uh, gain the full authority that had been promised. And he truly became king of the Jews. And that's a title that he maintained until he died. Politically speaking, Rome was strategically concerned with this eastern empire of Parthia which really was the old Medo-Persian Empire uh, that had become known now as Parthia. Rome had stretched its tentacles out to rule the world, but they never really felt secure about the Parthian Empire because they didn't conquer them. Israel was situated right between them, it became the battleground for these two violent enemies in 63, 55 and 40 BC. Now I'm putting a map up here so that you can see the Roman Empire at uh, the time of Jesus in the first century and it's in red uh, all around the Mediterranean and Parthia is to the east of that and let's look at a map of Parthia you can see it's the eastern side of that and it's just as large as Rome was uh, but we don't hear about the Parthian Empire too much in history. This is how the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire butted up against each other just north of Israel there in Syria. So you can see how these two massive groups would be um, contending with each other frequently. Okay, Rome's anxiety over this eastern empire was accurately reflected in Herod's response to the arrival of the Magi in uh, Matthew 2-3. Again, the text says that 
when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. <laughs> when he heard that these magi, these Oriental Parthian kingmakers, had arrived in Jerusalem, he came justifiably politically insecure. Because by the time of the Lord Jesus' appearance, the Magi still had tremendous power in the East. Some of them used their power, position, and skills with a great amount of human wisdom. Others, like the world, prostituted their craft. But both kinds of Magi were very common in the Mediterranean era when the Lord Jesus was born. Uh, Acts 8 and 13 speak of the corrupt ones. But at the time of Jesus in the Eastern Empire, there was a ruling body called the Megajantes, the Megajantes. And they would be similar in function to the United States Senate, for example. Uh, it was totally composed of magi who had the right of absolute choice with the selection of a king. Therefore, they were referred to as king makers. And when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem asking for the whereabouts of the new king that had been born, Herod panicked. Knowing these guys were Persian king makers had come to find their king. Herod was the king and he did not like to hear this. So there was no doubt they were traveling in full force with all their oriental pomp, riding Persian steeds. Uh, they weren't riding camels. And accompanying them, historians estimate that were a thousand mounted Persian cavalrymen. So it's not just three that uh, is sung about in our hymns. When they came to the city of Jerusalem and Herod saw them, he became justifiably nervous. That's why the Bible said he was troubled. The, the, the Greek word there conveys the idea that he was agitating like a washing machine, literally shaking. <laughs> And as king of the Jews, the great dream of his life was uh, to get this little buffer state in the middle of these two contending empires under his control. All of a sudden, this massive group of Persians arrived in the city, and he panicked because the new king they were coming to find would be a threat to the realization of his dream. And also because the retirement of Tiberius, who was Augustus's future successor, the Roman army was left without a commander-in-chief. The Parthians were aware of this, and it would be an ideal time to bring an eastern war against the west. Well, Herod knew this too. You know, the Bible says that they worshipped Christ. They saw more than just the king. They saw the Messiah, God in human flesh, that they had heard about from the days of Daniel. Daniel was the chief of the Magi when he was taken to Jerusalem. Now, not immediately. He was taken in 605 B.C., but he became uh, what was the equivalent of a prime minister and the chief of the Magi. When they came to Jerusalem, they were God-fearing Gentiles who envisioned this Savior, the Anointed One, the Messiah, as a king that would gather all the people of the East together against the oppression of Rome. You know, knowing, knowing that the people of Israel were on their side rather than Rome's, the Magi came into town and started asking the people where the new king was. <laughs> Most of the ruling Jews were blinded by their unbelief, and interestingly, some of the first people in the world to recognize the king were Gentiles. H history reflects the irony of rejection in John 1, 11, where it says that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, that's the leaders, of course, not the general population. But, but in spite of the general rejection of the king of the Jews, the Magi knew this child could be the great Messiah that Daniel had prophesied. They could have hoped this would be the one who could unify the East and go against Roman with invincibility, but most Jews were looking for a Messiah that would resemble a, a strong military man capable of throwing off the suzerainty of the, of the Romans and freeing them. And so in Jerusalem rides this group of magi, kingmakers of the East on their fine Persian steeds, and they're, they're it's, it's escorted by a thousand mounted cavalrymen. And, and, and they came into town asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod goes into shock. 
you know, the whole scene is uh, indicated in Matthew 2 where it was uh, that, that we read there. It was just completely unexpected and shocking for Magi to come from the east asking where the king of the Jews had been born. And historians record for us that uh, at that general time, it was a strange expectation in the world for a coming king. The people in the east had it, which partly explains why the Magi came. People in many places were anticipating the arrival of a king, something even the Roman historians acknowledged. It was the felt necessity of something happening. Suetonius wrote in the Twelve Caesars, he said, There had spread over all the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated at the time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Writing from the 2nd century A.D. about the things that, uh, as Vespasian's conquering of Israel in 70 A.D., Suetonius looked back and he said the 1st century was a day when there was an expectation for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Consequently, people's eyes were focused on that place. Tacitus, who's another famous Roman historian, tells of the belief in his book, The Annals, there was a firm persuasion that in the very time the East was to grow powerful, rulers coming from Judea were to acquire some universal empire. And Josephus the Jewish historian in the wars of the Jews said so the Jews had a belief that about the time one from their country should become governor of the habitable earth. So the Magi came to Jerusalem based on information they had received from Daniel the prophet and other Jews who were now living in their land since the captivity. A lot of them just stayed there after the Babylonians captured them and took them away and 586 B.C., a lot of them just didn't want to come back when uh, Cyrus said, you can go back. The Medes and the Persians didn't have any gripes with the Jews. A lot of them stayed there, though. God was going to fulfill his word. They repeatedly asked the Jews, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Where he's seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Herod must have known the child was more than a human king. He apparently knew that this was the Messiah, the anointed one, which the Magi were seeking. And um, like the wise man, he was aware that there was more than a humanly king coming to the earth. He knew someday God would send the Messiah. Now Herod's interrogation of the, of the chief priest about where uh, Christ was to be born, it just shows how subtly deceptive he was. It's amazing how people look to the Bible for information, but they won't accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. The chief priests and the scribes quoted Matthew 5-2 to Herod, informing him that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, and they knew that. It still paid absolutely no attention these events in Bethlehem. It's amazing these orthodox literalists had perfect head knowledge, but they were never touched in their souls. No wonder the Bible says, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. It didn't take long for the indifference of the chief priests and scribes issued in this hateful plotting of Christ's murder uh, directed by Herod. Now, from the indifference of Matthew chapter 2 to the plots and the murders at the end of the Messiah's life, 33 and a half years later, they had full knowledge of all the prophecies being fulfilled by Jesus Christ, and yet they rejected him with full information. Jesus himself even reminded them that all they had to do was to check the scriptures, which... They were supposed to be experts in. Well, Lord Jesus in John 5.39 is recorded. He said, search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. You know, Bethlehem has a really interesting story. In the book of Genesis, uh, Jacob buried Rachel there, setting a marker by her grave. Ruth married Boaz, and she lived in the town of Bethlehem, where she could see her homeland, which was Moab, across the Jordan River in the Dead Sea. Now, Bethlehem was a home 
and city of the great king of Israel, David. It is called the city of David, as a First Samuel indicates in chapter 16, 17, 20, and others. It was there in that little village that the people of God had long expected their Messiah to be born. In accordance with the prophecy of Micah 5, 2, they waited for David's greater son, the Messiah, to come out of David's city. But when the time of his birth did arrive, few were even aware of it. Herod was afraid that this little baby is going to interfere with his status in life. And jealous and fearful, he just sought to eliminate him. You know, people felt the same way 33 years later, successfully completing Herod's original plot of killing Jesus. Some people feel that way today. Jesus is just a, an interference in their life. He bothers them upsetting their plans, and if they had their choice, they too would eliminate him. Like the Hebrew, like the book of Hebrews says, those people know all about Christ, but still reject him, and in effect crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Put him in an open shame, if you will, Hebrews 6. 6. Jesus cautioned his disciples that... Uh, the hatred and the hostility of the world towards him and his servants. He said, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. It's from John fifteen eighteen. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God a service. John sixteen two. And of course, we see the hatred and the hostility exemplified by Herod as he tried to kill all the babies in that region. The chief priests and the scribes who were engrossed in their political intrigues and their acquisition of powers, and, and as well as making money at the temple at the, at the expense of the people, they didn't care that the Messiah had been born. There are many who are indifferent like that today. Oh, they conduct church services and for the sole purpose of making a living uh, as if the work of Christ was a business. They will be the people the Bible speaks of as having no awareness of his coming for his church. Matthew 24, 36 to 51. And we see the coming for the church, the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. But the Magi came to worship him knowing full well who he was and what he represented. And this was all due to what they had learned from Daniel the prophet. He was chosen to become chief of the Magi when he demonstrated superior ability interpreting dreams. We read about that in Daniel 5.11. By the divine coincidence, and I say that coincidence, it's not a kosher word, they say, <laughs> of having a great Hebrew prophet to rule the Magi 600 years before Jesus was born. God was in effect setting up the situation so that one day, when a baby was born in Bethlehem, some of those magi would find their way to the house where the young child was so that he could be acknowledged as king by known Gentile kingmakers. Folks, God controls human history. And we're seeing God at work. Long ago, he picked out a man named Daniel. He put him in a place to influence some men so that they could arrive in perfect timing. Interestingly, again, the people that should have known the great significance of the event missed it. And the people from way far off should have never guessed it would happen, showed up and worshipped the one who came to the Jew first. And then also to the Gentiles, as Romans 1.16 says, Jesus came and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, in Matthew 15.24. Israel turned her back on Christ. And again, it's not the common people. They all followed him for the most part, the leaders. He called a people, those who were not formerly his, Romans 9.25, he reached out to the Gentiles, Romans says, and grafted them in, Romans 11.17. Even the unbelief of his own people could not prevent the Messiah from being honored, as Jesus made really clear in Luke 
19, verse 40. And if the people wouldn't praise him, the stones would immediately cry out. <laughs> Therefore, uh, when the king arrived and his own people wouldn't praise him, then God made sure there was somebody there to do it. And as you know, in our world today, people celebrate Christmas by passing around Christmas cards and giving gifts, and they look at the wise men, but few really understand the significance of their presence before that child. There are some of us, however, who have followed the example of the wise men and bowed to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, I may remind you that uh, as we approach the Christmas season, we are blessed to be able to celebrate in a land that gives us the freedom to celebrate and uh, praise the Lord for sending our Savior, Jesus the Messiah, to this world. He is the Savior. He takes away the sins of the world. If you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Truly believe that so that your your belief is strong where you put your trust in him. God's Holy Spirit enters you, takes up residence for the rest of your life. It's called justification. You become a believer and you're on the way to heaven. And when your body fails, as all of them do, all of us do, your spirit will be in paradise with him, with the Lord Jesus at the point your body fails, his angels will come for you to take you to God and comfort you and love you and put you in a position of absolute paradise, absolute bliss. Throughout your life, you will grow increasingly more Christ-like, and that process is called sanctification. We're so blessed to be able to tell you these things, and we're so blessed to be able to celebrate it this time of year. In the next session, I'm going to cover the star, the star that led the Magi to where the Lord Jesus was in Bethlehem. Now, he wasn't an infant at that time because he was a little older. He was a very young boy, but he wasn't an infant. And then in the third session of this Christmas season, I'm going to talk about the place of Bethlehem and how appropriate God had decided that that's where the Lord Jesus would be born because it is very, very special. Well, God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.